we are very happy that you are joining uh, for your lunch break. Um, we appreciate your time. We would like to introduce you to Diego and Luis, the uh, founders of Conan and software engineers at JFrog. They will present to you today modern DevOps for modern C and C++. Um, we will record the session. This is the third part of a webinar series of three parts. If you are interested in the first two parts, we will send you the links after this meeting. If you have any questions, um, I would kindly ask you to put your questions in the chat or in the question uh, window and um, so that we don't disturb the webinar. And I wish you a great session with Diego and Luis. Thank you. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, uh, everyone that joined, depending on, on where you are in, in the world. So um, I'm Diego speaking. Uh, Luis has also prepared the, this webinar with me. Um, this is basically the third part of a, of a three-part series we, we have been doing uh, about, about uh, C++, package management with Conan, uh, JFrog uh, Factory, DevOps. Uh, for this webinar, I've tried to be quite independent of, of the first two ones. So there will be some things related, but I've tried to, even though if you didn't attend the, the first two, uh, you you would be able to understand what was happening, and then when, when with the links, if you are able to review the the first two webinars, then you will get the the whole picture uh, nicely. So for this one, um, we are we are addressing different things. First, we are talking about uh, how to manage testing and dev tools uh, in the in the workflow. Then I'm going to briefly present a uh, public free continuous integration services integration with uh, with Conan and Bintray. And then we are uh, making some examples about uh, doing DevOps with Jenkins, Artifactor, and Conan for the, for the enterprise. So let's just start with uh, this, ex this example. Let's say that we are developing a, a chat application. And we have a Hello library. Uh, that Hello library might depend, for example, on, on, a, on another library transitively, like uh, internalization. And then uh, for this Hello library, we have this. We, in our library, we, we have tests, and we are using the catch framework to, to code some, some tests. So now it happens that uh, when we are building and testing our, our Hello package, uh, we want to run this test to, to, make, to make sure that our package is correct and that, that the unit tests are, are passing. So it should be possible, for example, just to depend on, on catch. And I could add to, to my hello uh, package recipe, I could add a dependency to, to the catch uh, package. But this has some, some problems. Why? Because if I depend on the catch package from hello, what happens when my developers, they are developing the, the chat application downstream, uh, they depend on hello that is already a preview package. If the binaries are there, everything is fine. And when they retrieve hello, then they will be retrieving also catch. And probably that they don't need it at all because it's just a testing framework that the Hello package is using. So there is something uh, different uh, for, the, for the catch uh, testing framework. It's different from other dependencies. It's not a regular dependency. So the way that uh, Conan Package Manager is, is addressing these, these different requirements is via the build requires. These build requires, are, are requirements in the sense that, that they are dependencies and that they are, they are retrieved when necessary. So they serve the, the same properties as, as regular dependencies. So they can be transitive, they can have uh, options, they can be overridden from downstream, they can use version ranges, but they have a couple of things that are different. First, they are only retrieved if they are necessary to build the package. If the package is already there, because the, the, the binaries are there, uh, the, the, the build requirement will not be retrieved at all. And then also a different, uh, another property is that it doesn't affect the package ID. If you remember from the previous webinar, the package ID 
was the every different configuration, like like changing compiler or version or architecture, will generate a different binary. Uh, and also, if we depend on, on on other packages, that can affect also the the binary ID, because depending on, on different versions, we generate a different binary too. But in this case, depending on a, on a testing framework, shouldn't change at all my binary. So this is the the rationale be, behind that. Uh, having build requires doesn't change my, my my binaries, and then it doesn't change the, the the binary ID. So I'm going to show you. I have uh, everything is uh, demo prepared, so here I have a, a very simple uh, hello project, like the like the one I, I show you. So I'm going to show you the code. Okay, here it is. So I have my source uh, code here with my CMake, uh, a very simple hello function that is printing a re hello release or hello debug. And then I have my test here. This is my, my uh, test using the catch framework. Okay, so this will be, uh, this will be my, my hello package um, and it's going to be test. So uh, in the normal case uh, for a, a regular dependency, I, I would have this. I would have a requires and I, I would require the catch. Testing framework, and as I, I said, uh, this will retrieve the dependency always. But I want a different thing. I want a build requires. So all I have to do is just to specify this build requires here in my package recipe. And now I can show you my local cache is is clean, so there is nothing in my in my uh, install in my computer. So I'm going to export this recipe. Okay, so now, now the package recipe is in my local cache, but only the recipe, not, not the binaries yet. So now I'm, I want to, to really have the binaries for, for this, uh, for this uh, recipe. And so I'm going to install it. I'm going to install hello San Diego testing. Um, and then I want, if the package is missing, I want it to be built. And then also, I'm using an Artifactory instance here. You can, I can show you. So I have prepared a local in my machine just to make sure that everything wor is working without uh, re relying on, on the network. In this case, uh, I have an Artifactory instance running on my computer. Here you can see, and I, ha I have different packages preloaded in my local Artifactory. And here you can see that I, that I have the catch uh, package uh, for the testing program that I'm using. So I'm going to retrieve uh, what is needed for my local artifactory instance. Okay, here you can see that it is retrieving the the catch framework. It is being retrieved from artifactory. Now it is building the the package itself. So now the package is built. And now you can see the test, the catch test running here. So if I search my local cache, I will see that I have a binary that has been created for me with my default settings here. And if I do a colon search, I will realize that I, I have both my hello package and I also have my catch package here because uh, as I was building the package, it has had to be retrieved to in order to properly build and test the package. But if I remove it, going to remove catch. And now I only have my, my, um, my hello package I can install it again, and of course, it will not retrieve catch anymore. Why? Because I already have the, the 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 build package here. 
I can even upload it to Artifactory. Do you want to upload hello? Yes, I want. Okay. And I can completely remove my local cache. So my cache is empty. And now I can see that I have, I have my hello package here in Artifactory. So now if a developer wants to depend on the package, they can just install the package and they will get just the package because they don't need the cache framework at all. Okay, so um, this is uh, very useful as, as you, you have seen for, um, let, let's say, uh, testing libraries or testing frameworks. But what, what happens if now I have this different use case? Okay, so this is fine. I build a hello package with, with my Visual Studio that is installed in my machine and with my default CMake that it is a 3.7. But now I want to also build my, my hello uh, library package also with GCC 5.4 uh, com coming from min GW. And I will also want to test that uh, this package is, is possible to build it with CMake 3.3, just because my developers are using 3.3. And I want to make sure that this package can be built for this compiler and also with this CMake. So I could say, OK, I have packages. I can build packages for uh, retrieving both min GW and also for CMake 3.3. So it makes sense to uh, for Hello to introduce a build requirement uh, to those packages. So. I, I could be tempted, tempted of going to my recipe and adding here something like CMake 3.3, whatever. But it, uh, there is something a uh, bit weird with this pattern. Uh, if you analyze it, uh, what happens if you want to also test with uh, CMake 3.4? Or you want to use also a different mean G, uh, GCC version? Uh, would you add all of them here in build requirements? So uh, the answer is no. Typically, dev tools like compilers um, or CMake itself, uh, you don't want to introduce them into the recipes because they are quite, quite a, an orthogonal thing to the recipes. Actually, many developers will, will have just the, the, those dev tools. They will have them installed. So uh, if, if we make the hello package depend on them, we will be forcing the users to download uh, those, those MinGW and CMake packages to build them. Uh, and they are, they, they, it will take time to download them because they are, they are heavy. And they already have CMake installed and MinGW installed. So, so we want something that is decoupled from the recipe. So what we can do for this use case is this. OK, so there is a different way to um, define build requirements. We can do it in a, in a profile. If you remember profiles from, from the last webinar, they are just text files that they are summarizing uh, settings, options, and different things that build requires. So in this profile that I put in the, in the repo itself, so my, I can easily share this profile with my team if I want, uh, I've I have these uh, settings right now because I'm, I'm working, I'm going to build with GCC and this version and this standard library. And now what I'm doing in build requires, I'm going to say, hey, all the packages that matches this pattern, they are going to use this package. They are going to use min GW uh, from this user and this version. And they are also going to use CMake installer, this version, OK, so here is something A, but I want to use min GW uh, for, uh, sorry, 5.4 and CMake 3.3. OK, it happens that those packages uh, have the version of the, of the tool as an option. So you can also define the options for, for build requirements can be also specified in the profile. So here in my option section, I will say, hey, CMake, I want this version, and min GW, I want this other version. So if I if I want to change the versions, it's very easy. I can just change change these these options. Okay. So uh, with this profile, 
if now I want to, to build my, my package for for this uh, GCC and using a different CMake, I can just specify my profile. Okay. This might take a bit of time because uh, those packages are, are huge, but I want to show you some things. First, here we have uh, a different requirements. Is is installing the seven set uh, zip because it is needed for unzipping MinGW. So that is a transitive requirement of a build require that is MinGW. Okay. So now um, it needs all of these things to build the package. Of course, it is needed in catch again because it is building a new binary and it is as as long as it is building a new binary, it wants to, to run the test to ensure that the library is also working for GCC 5.4. So now it is retrieving everything it needs. So now it has retrieved catch. It is retrieving CMake 3.3. Uh, and MinGW will, will take, yeah, now it starts with MinGW min that will, will take a, a bit. So I'm going to explain a couple of things in the meantime about build requirements. Okay, so uh, I want to explain how, how these build requirements are working uh, with regard to the package. So uh, if you remember for the, for the past webinars, the packages, they declare two things in their package information method. They declare CPP info and MP info. Those, those uh, CP, CPP info will typically include all the include paths, library names, CPP flags, and so on. And environment info, MP info, uh, will encode like uh, environment variables uh, things like the path, Python path, or uh, LD library path, all things that will typically be environment variables, they can be defined by the packages. So when the catch package define some include directory, that include directory will be dynamically added to the hello library, to the hello package. So when, when the hello package is built, it will find the, the things that it needs from catch because they have been dynamically injected in the hello package. Uh, exactly the same as other dependencies, of course, but that will be transparent for the user because, because they don't have to declare specifically the requirement. They can be uh, injected from the profile. So it's not an explicit requirement, but uh, what everything is needed, like the include paths and library names and paths and everything, they are already active in the hello package. So when the hello package builds, uh, it has everything it needs inside. Also, a very cool thing about uh, these uh, build requirements for dev tools is that they can be used to do amazing things. For example, this is uh, an amazing work that uh, Luis was doing. So he created packages for the Android NDK. So uh, with the Android NDK, you can just inject the, it as a, as a build requirement to some libraries that they don't know anything about Android at all. So there were some some libraries like like lib, lib png or setlib that they they were just tested with uh, gcc and with uh, with visual studio and other compilers but they they don't know a word about android ndk so with this this package you can just add as a build requirement the android ndk and you can cross build those libraries those those package libraries uh, for android uh, transparently so this is very, very, very convenient and very, very powerful just to, to let you know. Uh, there is a, uh, this is fully documented in our docs. So if you go to docs.conan.io, you will be able to see the, the steps and to have the reference to the Android NDK packages you, you have to use. So I, I, I suggest you, you can have a look there. So let's see if this has finished. Yeah, just in time. So here we can see that, that we got all the all the things we need. We got we got the MinGW, and here we can see, actually, in the trace of the building that we are using GCC uh, five point four. Let me check if we are, yeah we also have the version here this three point three that is different from my three point seven installing my machine. We can see here that uh, the catch tests have been run. And all of it has been transparent uh, for me. I, I got 
two binaries for the for hello. One binary is of course my my Visual Studio 41, and the other one is the one for GCC 5.4 uh, compiled with uh, CMake 3.3. Okay, and I, I didn't have to to install anything at all in my in my computer. I just got the 730 installer CMake MinGW all as Conan packages and all injected in the hello um, in the hello recipe transparently because if you if we go back to the recipe we can see here that we we have nothing related to CMake to GCC uh, and MinGW or to of course to seven set framework so this is a very powerful uh, combination. Okay, so uh, now I would like to introduce um, how to create packages in continuous integration, but uh, in this case for open source packages. So if we are doing open source and we, we want to contribute uh, open source packages, uh, we can do it absolutely for free because we, we have like amazing services. We have, of course, GitHub, uh, but we also have Travis and a pager. Uh, and uh, Conan has uh, a tool called Conan Package Tools that works very well with Travis and Arpeggio. So it is able, for example, to, to put Docker images for different compilers, for getting a compiler for GCC, uh, any version of GCC, we, almost any version of GCC, we have a Docker image, but it's very convenient that it can be installed in Travis and then build uh, the packages you want for different flavors of compiler and compiler version. And also a payer will be a continuous integration service service for for Windows, uh, so you can you can create your packages there. And for from those continuous integration services, Travis and a payer, you can automatically upload to Bitray, for example, with that, that now is the main repository for for distribution of C++ Conan packages. And also, if uh, what we are building it has dependencies. And those dependencies are already in JFrog. Uh, they can be pulled. So they, uh, in the continuous integration job in Travis or Arpeggio, as a first step, can just pull the dependencies it needs to build, then build, and then upload the packages to 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 Bintray. And then from Bintray, and of course, when the developers around the world they want to consume those, those packages, they can just uh, require those packages, and they will be retrieved from from Bintray. So that would be a, a complete uh, DevOps uh, workflow for, for uh, public and, and open source packages. So I want to show you how, how easy this can be done. So here I, I have a, another uh, simple hello project. Uh, it will be basically the same, the same hello function. Uh, just simplify that I have removed the, the catch testing right now to be to be fast. So, but in a sense, the the package will be exactly the same. So, what I I've had to, I've added to this to this uh, package is first I added a script for Travis. This is a typical Travis YAML file uh, with the standard Travis syntax. It's, it's not something we 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 have invented. Just as defining as the Travis service, you have to create this 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 file. And put it in the root of your of your packet or, or your library, whatever. Then here we, we are defining several things, okay, typical things of, of Travis. And then uh, in this environment variables, we are specifying different things. For example, that we want our packages to be uploaded. And we want them to be uploaded to, to this repo here. Okay. Then we also specify the reference of the package, the, the name and the version, the user and the channel. Okay, now the, this one is not necessary right now. And then we, we introduce a matrix of all the versions we want to use. Uh, here we can see that this is, we are going to build for uh, GCC 4.9, and we are going to use Docker. So instead of trying to, to install a different version of GCC on the native Travis instance, we are loading a, a Docker image that uh, comes with GCC for 4.9 by default. Okay, the same for GCC 5.4, and exactly the same for uh, GCC 
So in this case, we are going to build for Linux for three different uh, configurations, and we are going to build for for also for Mac OS X, also for the lat the latest uh, versions of Apple client. Okay, then uh, the rest is uh, these scripts are always the same. I'm just adding here my bin tray repository. I want to upload my packages to. And that will be basically the, 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 the what we need for for Travis that will generate both Linux and OS OS X Mac packages for for me, and then we will also have a very similar YAML file for AppBayer that is the, the Windows continuous integration system with the same variables. Hey, we want to upload the packages to this repository. We have the reference, the user, the and the channel. And then in this case, we will be building for different flavors of Visual Studio. We will be using Visual Studio 14, uh, sorry, 15, 14, and 12. Finally, we have a script that is, is using the Conan package tool, uh, associated uh, tool of, of Conan that we I explained before. It is in the, our GitHub repository. So you can space also open source. You can inspect the code there and contribute whatever. So uh, in this, in most cases, it will be just three lines, just instances the builder, uh, adding common builds, and making the builder run. Basically, these those three lines are the ones responsible of getting the Docker image and launching the, the, the matching build inside the image, so, so you get the package. So in order to, to build this, I could just uh, change my message, whatever, do whatever change I want to, to do to my job. So there are changes here. I'm going to add. I'm going to commit the changes. I'm going to push to GitHub. Okay, so I push to GitHub. This is my GitHub repository where my my project lives. And what I have, I have uh, both Travis and a payer um, that they are connected to the to this GitHub repository. So automatically, as they are connected, we see Travis that has has created um, a, a job here. And in this job, we can see that it is is going to create packages for these versions that they are the ones configured in my scripts. So in this case, three versions for Linux and two versions for for Mac, and same here for a Bayer. We will see that 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 we have now. Sorry, this one. So now it has started to work on the first one that is going to create packages for Visual 15, and we will be also building versions for for 14 and 12. Now the jobs are are launched. It will take a couple of minutes, and finally the result will be dumped up here. So I have this is my bin tray repository. Right now, uh, as you can see, this is empty. Okay, so just in a few minutes, when when these jobs finish, we will see that all the the, the binaries are are here, are in bin tray and are already available for for my users or my team to be to be downloaded and to be and to be used. So, uh, by the way, the Docker images that are are being used to to be in Travis. Are also available in in Docker Hub. So here you can see all the all the images that are. Of course, you can use them for for other things if you want. They are just uh, images with different uh, Dev Tools versions installed. Okay, so uh, I will leave this here working. It will take uh, a few minutes, and we will see the result in in a while. Now I want to to proceed and start. Um, talking about a, a more more corporate, a more enterprise setup. So in this case, for uh, the typical setup would be okay. I'm going to have a, a an artifact server. It's going to be Jacob Artifactory in my company, and that comp that that that, uh, that server will will host packages for all the all the different systems and configurations that I'm building. So I can I could have a Jenkins uh, job and a Jenkins job uh, with the slaves in Windows in Linux. And, and then all of these jobs, they can upload their binaries to Artifactory, 
and they they will put the binaries all in the same place for the for the same package so they will be they will be managed properly so then when a developer they they want uh, they want to use a package or they want to create a release for for their system first they will receive the package recipe and then if they are working in windows and they want to to use visual studio 14 only the binary they need will be retrieved so artifactory can host binaries for many 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 different configurations and compilers and operating systems but when developers or releases need the package only that binary will be retrieved uh, for that so in this sense it's very very efficient so the typical um, infrastructure in uh, for the enterprise would be could be like this so we have developers that are they are pushing changes uh, to their uh, git servers or uh, gitlab or github uh, enterprise and then we will have the jenkins jenkins will be a, will be the one building the the things for jenkins uh, there's a an, a plugin from artifactory it's called the jenkins artifactory plugin and that plugin already provides um, a syntax to manage conan conan client and conan uh, and conan remote that are very common we will see in a while then jenkins we will will create the packages and we'll put them to to artifactory so for artifactory they are ready to be deployed or to be uh, used by other developers or the team so first i'm going to see to show a simple example yeah i still not finished uh, the previous one yeah so I, i'm going to give it more, more time Okay, so uh, I'm going to show you the syntax of the Jenkins plugin. We we are going to use because we are going to build the the same hello package that we we have been uh, we have been showing, but we are going to build it in in Jenkins. So for that we can use the pipelines that are they are basically Groovy scripts uh, that we we can load in Jenkins uh, at the typical uh, the typical uh, pipeline will be something like this. We will be defining the artifactory instance we want to use and the repo we want to use. We will be defining uh, our sources for our package. And then we will define several stages. The first stage, in this case, will be uh, getting the recipe from, from Git. Then we will define our infrastructure, basically defining our server, our client. So this is syntax that is already available in the, in the Jenkins plugin. Then using this client we got we will go we are going to to create the package the test package is actually creating and testing the package and finally when everything is ready we will be uploading the package to our remote so if we want to to do a, a, an automatic automatic task for for this we can just go to jenkins let's create a new item Let's, let's call it package build, for example. It's going to be a pipeline. And then all I have to do is to, to I'm just copying the, the script I, I, I just saw you. And I'm going to launch a build. Of course, you, you, can, you can, the typical thing would be to activate triggers they connected to a Git repository, so when you push to the to the repository, then it will fire the task. Now I'm firing it manually uh, because it's more more easy for the demo. So now we can see the stages that they are doing. So it cloned uh, from Git from Git the recipe. It configured everything. Now it, it is actually building the the package and testing the package. Yeah, it will take a while because it's uh, actually building and testing on, on my machine. It is not as late. Now, I, I'm right now building everything locally.
Yeah, it seems my machine is very loaded with everything I'm running. Okay, now it finished. So it created the package and now it is uploading the package to my Artifactory instance. Now this should be fast enough. So here we can see, let's refresh. And now, uh, of course, this is a different package here. That was This is the one created by, by Jenkins job. And here we can see the binary that is already available for my team. Also, an interesting thing we can see here is that we, we, we have collected the build info. The build info is this, this thing that is linked here from, uh, from Jenkins. And it is, it is the information collected from, from the whole build. So in this case, for example, it is reporting that it has uploaded to Artifactory these two modules uh, that are related to the package. But if this package had dependencies, those dependencies will also be reported here. So what we would have uh, with the build info for this build is we have the information of everything that is connected to this package. So if we want to promote the whole build, including dependencies, for example, to a different repository for deployment, we using the build info, we can do that. We can just copy not only the package, but everything connected to the package from this build and promote the whole build uh, from repository to repository. So that's very convenient to, to create a pipeline from development to, to deploy. So this would be the, the, the basic creation of, uh, of packages from, from uh, Jenkins. Now I wanted to, to show you a, a more difficult example. Let me check just how these builds are, are going. Okay, they, they are taking some, some time. Um, so I, I want to show you a more difficult example. What happens when we have this? Okay, so so we, we, we have not only a package, but we, we also have a, a full project or several projects, and, and there are many different packages uh, interconnected. So um, when we have, for example, package A here, and we introduce some changes, and we mm, push the changes, and new version of the, of the package is created. Now we 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 have a, a task to do. We have to rebuild the dependencies. Okay, I, I'm not talking about a bumping version. If you have a version uh, one, and you do some changes, and you uh, bump the version, and you create a, a point two, that is not the problem because this uh, it is already a different version. And you have to change version of the consumers, and that would be uh, like uh, it would be a continuous uh, upgrading from version one to two, and so on. But I'm not saying only that. What happens if you are just developing a developed version, and all the packages uh, are working against the latest version of the of the of the libraries and the packages, and you then you do a, a change to A. Now it happens that you have to review uh, the the whole graph downstream. Uh, and of course, it's something that you, you want to do uh, smart because if you, for example, you change only B, uh, uh, you don't want A or C to be rebuilt because they don't need to be rebuilt. Uh, they, they were fine. So we want like a smart propagation of changes in, a, in our graph. So in this case, what we are going to, to do right now is a, is a, a prototype that, that Luis has been working on is okay so we are going to create a, a couple of tasks here uh, there will be a, a multi-build with the manager that will be uh, spawning like like simple tasks like it will be the the same task that we are we have been used for for creating a package uh, but they can be fired in parallel so in this case the manager will first start with a and will be will a and then it will continuously uh, go downstream down the graph, and we'll, the second step will will create a, a new new task to build B. And then for the third step, 
it, it knows that it can be it can build in parallel both C and, and F because they are not connected. So so just to take advantage of our continuous integration system, it can build many things in parallel. So in this case, it will fire both C and, and F in parallel. And finally, it will build uh, D and G also in parallel because uh, they are also not connected, so they can also be built in parallel to save time. Actually, this is this is only a simplification because if we are uh, creating like like two different, we are creating packages and we are developing our application for two different architectures. For example, for 64 bits and 32 bits. Actually, those are two two graphs, two independent graphs because the the 64 bits uh, artifacts they will be depending on 64 bits dependencies and 32 bits packages they will be depending on 32 bit packages too so we have actually like two graphs like this so so the this this manager is actually able to to fire those in parallel too so it will parallelize not down the graph uh, checking checking uh, which nodes are not connected but also it will parallelize also different architectures and different different project, different profiles in in general so i'm going to show you Here, okay. it, it is called the uh, the Skynet example for some reasons. Uh, so, so so now in this in this um, uh, example we have two two tasks. The first one would be will be this one is called the the single build or the simple build. It's basically the same that we that we uh, we checked before. It's just creating a package. Uh, here we have the, the configuration for Artifactory. It is uh, checking the sources. It is testing the package to create and test the package. And finally, it is uploading to Artifactory. So the information for, for getting the structure of the project is in a YAML file with this, with this uh, look. So uh, first, it is defining how many profiles, how many different configurations I want to build. Then it is defining uh, when to upload, where to upload the, the package, in this case to Artifactory and to this repo. And then it is defining just all the libraries that are in this project and where to get the, the sources for them. So there will be just a list of, of libraries with the, with the sources. And then the, we have the, the multi-build. It's going to be the manager. It's a bit more complex, but in any case, it is just about 130 lines of, of, of code. Uh, by the way, we will be releasing all of these very, very soon. So that you will be able to find this both in the documentation and in our GitHub repositories. Um, so this will be easily available. And probably most part of this will be autom automated also in the Jenkins plugin. So, so just keep tuned because we will be releasing all of this. So basically, this, this manager is just grouping the task and, and launching the other task. So the, I want to show you here the, yeah, the core here is this function here. This is a Conan command. Conan has a command that is called the info bit order that if you issue, you can issue this command in the command line. So it will give you an array of, of dependencies in the right order to be built. So calling that, you can get an idea of what, what has to be rebuilt when you do uh, changes to a dependency graph. So using this command, it can get the information and then lately use that information to fire what is needed in, in our Jenkins. So I'm going to, to show you then. First, I'm going to create in, in Jenkins. Uh, It's called simple build. It's going to be also pipeline. And I'm just copying the, the script. Now I'm also going to create the multi build for the manager. It's going to be a pipeline too. Okay.
and here we go. Okay, so now I can just fire the the manager task. This will be typically oh, sorry. No, it's working. Uh, this will be typically also something that you will configure to to get your uh, Git push to fire this this task, of course. So first, it is fetching the things, and now it's going to be. So I'm going back to my dashboard, and I'm going to check the simple build. Now it is empty, but but soon we we should see jobs that are being fired. By the way, I have a, a total of four workers uh, for Jenkins configured. So th that this means that I can have uh, one job is for the multi-build manager, and then I have three uh, spare workers to be, to be used. So in this case, it has fired uh, the building of lib A, both for 32 and 64 bits. So what it's doing here is doing this step, okay? But um, for both architectures, for 32 and 64 bits simultaneously. So then when it finishes, okay, now it is uploading to Artifactory. Now it's going to, to fire two more, two more builds. Is going to, to fire the build for lib B, both for 32 and 64 bits. So now it's doing this step. It is, uh, A is already built. It is building B, both for 32 and um, 64 bits. Now it is building the packages. Okay, now so B has finished, and now it, it has created four jobs. Okay, so these four jobs will, will be those for, for this. It is building both C and F, both for 32 and 64 bits. So if we go here, we will see that it's going to be to, be, to build C and F for 32 and uh, 64 bits, and as I only have three workers there is uh, there is a task here that will have to wait until some some workers are are released but typically if you have a, a farm of slaves for different architectures and operating systems this could be this could be, this could be uh, much faster of course so now it's building both c and f and uploading everything to artifactory Okay, now F has to finish. And now when C and F are built, then it will proceed to the latest two nodes that will be D and G. Okay, so it finished with C and F. And now it's going to, to fire in parallel both D and G, both for 32 and 64 bits. So here we can see the four jobs, both for 32 and 64 bits for G and D. And the same as, as before, we, we have three workers 
working right now, and we have a task that we have to wait here. So, um, of course, when all these uh, packages they have finished, they have been uploaded to Artifactory. Sorry, to Artifactory. So here for lib A, we can see that we have updated packages for both. Here you can see the the architecture. You can see the 32 bits and the 64 bits packages that have been automatically updated by, by our continuous integration. Yeah. So finally, the last package here. And of course, the multi build should finish early too. Yeah, so I think this is this is mo mostly uh, what it is. Just I to finish uh, the webinar, I would like to show you my well. This is this is really slow today. So uh, th these were the. The jobs that I fired for continuous integration using Travis and Apeyer for open source uh, for the Hello C package. Uh, so here we can see that we already had like a, like the Linux and OS X uh, packages have been created. And if I go and check my my Bintra repository, I will check. I will see that now I have a package here with the 0 0.1 stable version. And if I go to files, I will be able to see that I have all these different binaries created for me automatically in uh, in Travis. So I can I could actually do a search search hello CI zero point one uh, sorry. Uh, this the package name is draw stable so i'm looking in bin tray for this packet and it will output all the different binaries that i have created for for this package in in travis and abayer Actually, most of them will be will be from Travis because a uh, Bayer is, is is going really slow today. Yeah, it takes a while because we have so many different binaries created for us, but we we can see here that we we have binaries for Visual Studio 14, for Apple Clan 8, for uh, Apple Clan 8, uh, Visual Studio 12, and debug 32 bits. So we have tons and tons of, of different binaries here that have been created uh, for us. With just adding two scripts, actually three scripts to our to our repository. So this will be the the end of my uh, presentation. Uh, if the, if you can, I, I would encourage you to join us. We will be will be in the Jenkins User Conference the 13th of July in Tel Aviv. So if you can go there, we we will be there talking about these things and, and many more. And of course, if you want more information, you can you can check anytime at uh, conan.io, uh, also in our GitHub repositories uh, for open source things, and of course at jackfriend.com. And now, uh, time for questions. If you have any questions, you, you can write it. Yes, Diego, thank you very much for the presentation. So we have a couple of questions. Uh, the first one is, so how does Conan react to mismatches in dependency versions? For example, A depends on C in version 3 and B depends on C in version 4, while D depends on A and B. And if that was uh, too complicated to understand and just <laughs> by me saying it, you can read it um, in the um, question box. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm. I'm seeing it. So. So. But that's a very good question. So Conan has the uh, very typical conflict resolution. Uh, this is called like when you have a dependency conflict here. So uh, in the default case, if you have a conflict uh, you have a conflict of, of dependencies, it will warn that there is a conflict, and it will keep the 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 first one. Okay. But we also have like a strict mode. So if you provide the the dash w error, uh, then 
it will treat dependency conflicts and errors and it will stop and it will throw you a message that says that you have an error. So when you have a conflict of, of dependencies, the one that is responsible to resolve the conflict is the downstream user. So if you are using both A and B and they, they depend on different versions of C, then you have to, to decide downstream A, okay, I want to use C version 4 or C version 3. You will be the one to, to decide how to resolve the conflict. That also uh, is implemented for options. What happens, not only, not only uh, versions, but what happens if you depend on version C uh, in the static mode, in static library mode, and in, uh, by other path of the dependency graph, you depend on C or on a, on a dynamic library mode. Then you also have, have a conflict. It's going to be the same version, but you will, also, you will have a conflict of configuration of the library. In this case, it's exactly the same. The one responsible to, to resolve the conflict is the downstream user. So downstream users can specify the version and the options for, that, for upstream packages. And those uh, specified by the users will be overridden downstream. So it will force upstream to use those dependencies instead of the, the ones they had declared. So that would be the typical uh, workflow for uh, conflict resolution. There is also a special mode of, of dependencies. There is the private mode. So a package can depend on, on another one privately. And that will like uh, expand the dependency graph. And you, you will be able to, to have different versions of the same package in the same graph if you match some requirements. Uh, the API cannot be transitively uh, addressed. Uh, it shouldn't affect the API compatibility. You shouldn't move objects uh, in the API boundaries between packages. But if you match all of this, you can even use different versions of the same package in the same tree. It's not a very used feature. I mean, I wouldn't recommend it, but it is possible just using private private requirements. Okay, thank you very much. Um, another question is, uh, with Conan package tools, is there a support for other on-premises CI systems like GitLab or Bamboo? Uh, there is nothing explicit uh, right now in, in, our, in our code base, uh, but it is uh, very easy. For example, uh, for, for Travis and Abayer, uh, there is nothing on Travis and Abayer's side to support Conan. And, and just with the Conan package tools, uh, uh, associated tool, you can, you can do it very easily. So uh, if you want to, to do some integration with other, other uh, enterprise, other uh, on-premises, a continuity service that is not Jenkins. Probably it is not as convenient as Jenkins, but you can definitely do it. We we have been reported by users doing so, uh, so it is definitely possible. Just probably the, the main issue would be like the password for the for the remote. Uh, it might be in plain text and at some point because if you don't have the integration, you cannot hide the password in an environment variables or something like that. So, so you have to be a bit careful about that. But otherwise, uh, it, it, is, it is very easy to integrate with other continuities. It is not explicit syntax, but it can be done. OK, great. Uh, there's one more question, but I think um, we are a little bit short of time, so we will answer this question by email. Um, if anybody else has a question, please feel free to reach out to us by email. Um, we are happy to answer all your questions. We will send you an email after this webinar with this recording and also with the links to the first and second part of this webinar series. So I thank you very much for the presentation, Diego, and I thank everyone for your time and interest and wish everyone a great remaining day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye.